I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute. And I want to welcome you all to our March Conservative Women's Network. And thank you all for coming out on this snowy, rainy day. Um, I think it's all going to melt by tonight, which is the good news. That's what we hope for. Fingers crossed. I want to give a special thanks to our CWN co-host, Bridget Wagner, the Heritage Foundation, our partner in these luncheons for many years. And now I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Ying Ma. Ying Ma is an expert on China, international affairs, the free market, and conservatism, and is fluent in Chinese Mandarin and Cantonese. A columnist for the Wall Street Journal's China blog, Ying is the author of Chinese Girl in the Ghetto, a memoir about getting to know freedom after legally immigrating with her family to inner city Oakland, California from communist China at the age of 10. Ying will be signing copies of her book uh, after uh, the uh, lecture here if you'd like to purchase a copy and she's happy to sign it for you. Ying's articles have been, per have been uh, published in the Los Angeles Times, the Weekly Standard, FoxNews.com, and many other publications. She's appeared on numerous television and radio programs and is currently a policy advisor at the Heartland Institute, a free market think tank in Illinois, and has also served as a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institute of War, Revolution, and Peace at Stanford University. Previously, Ying practiced law at a leading global law firm headquartered in New York and managed corporate communications for a mainland China-based internet company. She served on the first professional staff of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, a congressional commission established to examine America's economic relationship with China. She received her B.A. from Cornell University, and one day, a few years ago, when she was an undergraduate, she called me and she asked me if the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute would help her bring in a conservative woman speaker to present a different point of view uh, than what women, uh, they regularly heard from at Cornell. And we were able to start, it was the, we were able to help and, and uh, it was the start of a long friendship, although there were a number of years in between when we didn't get to see each other. And, and just last week, she went back to Cornell and gave a lecture herself. At Cornell, she served as president of the Cornell Review, a bi-weekly conservative newspaper by the conservative students there. And this month, the, her going back for a lecture was kind of special, wasn't it? The topic was uh, prevailing over the welfare st state, and it was her story of getting out of the ghetto. She also earned a Juris Doctor from Stanford Law School, and in law school, she was president of the Stanford chapter of the Federal Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. She's a great conservative with a unique background. You're going to love reading her book. Please join me now in welcoming Ying Ma. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Michelle, thank you so much for that very kind welcome. And uh, thanks, special thanks to the Heritage Foundation for hosting me. Um, I am very grateful to Michelle and the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute for all that she's done and all that her staff has done for conservatism and to set an example for young women all across the country. Uh, as Michelle mentioned earlier, I was involved a number of years ago, and I was certainly a beneficiary of all the work that she's led over the years. Um, there's something that a lot of people don't know about me, which was that many years ago, I was actually here at Heritage as well. I was an intern here in college, and I uh, worked for a department that no longer exists. It was Policy Review, the flagship publication um, of Heritage back then. And, and uh, this was a great introduction to what conservative politics was like on the national level. Um, um, and, and I loved every minute here. And it is great to be back. It's very special to be behind this podium as well. Um, I am grateful to the Conservative Women's Network. Um, these days, women all across the country are bombarded with messages about how they should live, what they should believe in, and what aspirations they have. Um, and bossy liberal women are constantly telling us to do things like lean in, decry the so-called war on women, um, and get excited about reproductive rights. Um, one thing that's always a bit odd is that these women who've got lots of things to say and lots of um, advice to give others rarely have anything to say when, for instance, a comedian decided that it would be funny to call for 
Governor Sarah Palin to be gang raped by a bunch of black men. These women actually also have very little to say when, for instance, a noted female Democratic strategist ridiculed former Massachusetts First Lady Anne Romney for having chosen the home instead of the workplace as her career. So no thank you. No thank you to all these bossy liberal women telling us how to live our lives and telling us what to do. And I am grateful to CWN for holding this conversation once a month, for giving us a voice, giving us a support network, um, giving us an alternative, and um, allowing us to, to air all those views um, in which we differ from the, right, from the left, not just on politics, but on our values. Uh, so I am honored to, to be here uh, to take part in an effort that will cede no territory to that phony war on women. Um, uh, I want to get to the topic of today's talk, which is uh, an area where we should cede no territory as well, and that is in the conversation about race, about poverty, about inequality, and about economic freedom. Uh, these are topics that I cover in my book, although the book is not a policy book by any means. Um, and as Michelle mentioned earlier, it's titled Chinese Girl in the Ghetto. Uh, and I wrote it for, for many reasons, but certainly one of the reasons was Barack Obama's presidency and the vision that he uh, held out for this country. Uh, his presidency is the presidency that should have brought us racial unity. It should have um, ended our racial divisions, but instead in the last seven years or so, we've seen more racial division than ever. We've seen a barrage of racial grievances. His presidency was also one that was supposed to deliver economic prosperity. It has not. Um, and instead, we have seen class warfare. We have seen a whole lot of government dependency, and we've seen a record number of Americans on food stamps. So in this era of Obama, I have a different story to tell. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why I wrote my book. Uh, and the story that I tell is one about hard work. It is one about individual responsibility. And it is also one about the abundant opportunities offered by America. This is the story of my family's journeys, my family's journey from post mao communist China to inner city Oakland, California. Um, and this is also the story that I elaborate on in my book. Um, now, Oakland, uh, you may not know, has the dubious honor of being the second most dangerous city in America. It is uh, right there behind Detroit. And I get a lot of questions um, from uh, friends and acquaintances about why my family showed up in Oakland, inner city Oakland, of all places, while there are lots of better cities in, in America. Um, and the, I, I al always sort of tell them a long story, but ultimately the answer is actually very simple. Um, the answer has to do with economic equality. Uh, you see, in the Oakland of my childhood, there was plenty of economic equality to go around. There was plenty of the fairness that Barack Obama talks about so much. Um, and we were equal in our lack of access to running hot water. We were equal in our lack of access to amenities like washers, dryers, color television. And we were equal in our... Um, common access to the indignity of not having a modern toilet facility. And amid the dearth of opportunity, uh, the state was everywhere. It told us where to live, where to work, what to buy, and for how much. Back then, China was not yet the second largest economy in the world. Uh, in fact, in 1980, for instance, China's GDP was, or GDP per capita, uh, was less than $200. In America at that time, it was over 12,500. So you have 200 on the one hand, 12,500 on the other. And so for my family, it was really no, a no-brainer. Uh, we had an opportunity to come to America, and we seized it. We didn't ask any questions. We didn't know anything about Oakland, but we knew that we wanted to be here. And so we left. Uh, and we showed up in Oakland, and it turned out to be a city that was cloaked in poverty, in urban decay, and in racism. Uh, my family had limited financial resources, so we f fought our way out of poverty the old-fashioned way. We worked. Um, I know that many of you have heard about 
President Barack Obama's efforts to raise the national minimum wage, the federal minimum wage, which now I, I believe is at 725. Um, so when my parents first came here, they would have loved to have worked for a job that was at the minimum wage level or above. But being immigrants, new immigrants who didn't speak any English, uh, they didn't have a whole lot of choices. And one thing that they recognized as people in the job market is that jobs don't just fall out of the sky because you want higher wages and employers don't hire more people simply because the government tells them to. And so my parents took whatever job they could. Uh, at first working for some minimum wage jobs, uh, at f there were times when they worked more than one job. Um, and over time, they gradually found better opportunities but even though Barack Obama says it's some kind of gross injustice for us not to raise the minimum wage, for my parents back then, what they knew was that the real gross injustice was to not work and not put, not put food on the table for their two young children. There was also rampant racism in the ghetto. Uh, not the kind, not the kind that Attorney, Eric, uh, Attorney General Eric Holder likes to talk about so much. When we arrived in the ghetto, we found ourselves a new name. The ghetto bestowed on us a new name. And our new name was Chinaman. And this was a name that was bestowed on everybody who was Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, Filipino, anybody who looked Asian. And this was their name too. So criminals threw racial epithets at us, uh, some of which were far worse than Chinaman. Um, at the same time, they had their own version of racial profiling. Uh, and oftentimes they targeted Asian individuals, particularly elderly Asian individuals, because they were more likely to carry cash, they were likely to wear jewelry. Um, and yet these horrible acts of racism went unnoticed by the mainstream media and by mainstream society because they were perpetrated by minorities that the left had long ago decided were incapable of racism. In Oakland, the public educational system was pretty horrible, too. There were instructors who regularly left their classrooms uh, with the students uh, unattended. There were students who dropped out of school either because they didn't want to learn or because they hung out with the wrong crowd or they became involved with a the gang. There were parents who saw their children's education as not part of their responsibility. And there were, so amid all the bad teachers, bad schools, there were plenty of bad students and bad parents. Violence and lawlessness was everywhere as well. Um, there were gunshots outside of my window on a regular basis, perhaps not every day, not every week, not every month, but enough for me to finally learn what that those shots ringing, those, that popping sound ringing outside of my window wasn't exactly firecrackers. Um, I remember the first time I heard it, I. I heard a gunshot outside of my window. I asked my father what that was, and, and he is a veteran of the, um, of the Chinese military, and of course he's heard gunshots plenty of times in his life, and, and it didn't faze him, and he said, oh, those are just gunshots, and we went back to watching our television programs, and soon enough I learned to ignore them as well, um, and it was a little bit disturbing when, I, when my father discovered a bullet lodged on the side of our house, but at least it wasn't lodged in any of us. So despite all the difficulties that my family faced, we didn't demand racial or ethnic preferences for employment or university admissions, but such preferences were doled out lavishly to the children of middle class and upper middle class families whose skin color was considered much more fashionable than mine. Regardless, my family prevailed. We got out. Uh, but because I grew up in the ghetto, I actually know a fair amount about all those so-called root causes that people on TV talk about regularly. Uh, we noticed all of these people talking about these root causes, such as poverty, such as racism, such as a bad education, particularly when the violence in Ferguson flared up last summer and also more recently. Now. Much like the rioters in Ferguson, I have a certain amount of experience with law enforcement. My experience, however, is very different, and my sentiments toward law enforcement are very different. Um, the rioters, it seemed, or at least according to them, they were angry about the police being too aggressive 
being too racist. I actually was angry for all those times when the police was not there. I wanted to know where was the police when my house was robbed. We, we were the police officers when a few teenage female hooligans ran up to my father's car when he made the mistake of stopping at a stop sign with his windows rolled down right in front of a corner liquor store and they ran to him and beat him right through the window just for laughs. And I wanted to know where the police were. Every time that I wanted to take a stroll in my neighborhood or sit outside on my front porch at night, but could not because I didn't want to get shot. So, yeah, we all do have our experiences with law enforcement, and law enforcement is supposed to serve a purpose. But the questions I asked are questions that talking heads on CNN simply do not have any interest in and never ask. And these are the questions that Obama's Justice Department have zero interest in asking. Instead, Eric Holder spent months trying to nail a, an innocent, and we now know that he is an innocent white officer who ended up shooting an unarmed black teenager. Um, it was a tragedy, but there were all kinds of people who stirred up a whole lot of violence and a whole lot of hate uh, by presuming that this officer was guilty to begin with. And when Eric Holder could not pin any blame on this officer, he decided to issue a highly specious and utterly despicable report attacking the entire Ferguson Police Department. Now, nobody, nobody is asking. All those people who lied, all those people who rushed to judgment, all those people who made up the narrative of hands up, don't shoot, to take some responsibility. Nobody has come forth to offer an apology to Officer Darren Wilson, the white officer who shot the unarmed black teenager. And nobody has offered an apology to the city of Ferguson for having set it on fire. Oakland certainly was a place that was prone to riots as well, so I know a bit about that too. Um, the thing about riots is that when hooligans run around looting, laughing, cursing, burning things, they are destroying their own communities. Uh, they are burning down and looting the businesses owned by their neighbors, most likely, by all the hardworking people <coughs> who often are minorities themselves. The convenience store owner that Michael Brown uh, robbed or mugged, um, however you want to call it, or manhandled right before his death, that man was not some white guy who had spent his life discriminating against black people. He was a South Asian immigrant who most likely had not taken, taken a vacation day in years. And we've got all kinds of activists speaking up for hooligans who have looted stores um, and who have burnt down establishments in Ferguson. Who speaks for that South Asian shop owner? Who speaks for all the poor minorities who live in bad neighborhoods, who abide by the law, who open up small businesses, and who create jobs, and whose livelihoods are destroyed by those thugs who are constantly chanting slogans in the, names of, in the name of racial justice? There are lots and lots of minorities in poor neighborhoods who do not loot, who do not commit arson, and who do not break the law. And I know because I was one of them when I lived in the ghetto. And when I did not commit arson and when I did not loot and when I did not steal, do you know what I did? I studied my butt off and got into Cornell University, which I recently had the pleasure of visiting again. To people like President Obama, I had no business, no business getting out of the ghetto without extensive government assistance. This is because in the welfare state mentality that he peddles, the poor simply cannot succeed. They simply cannot succeed without long-term government dependency. This mentality and its corresponding policies are so enmeshed in the fabric of our society that oftentimes regular citizens like you and me actually have a hard time imagining how to extricate ourselves from the welfare state's tentacles. This is not to say that inequalities don't exist or that hardships aren't there or that hardworking people who have trouble making ends meet don't feel that sometimes the system simply is stacked against them. For example, when I showed up at an elite law school on the West Coast, I encountered a whole bunch of snotty kids who had been entitled all their lives 
but who congratulated themselves on being sensitive about race, gender, and sexual orientation. So while all these sanctimonious, some, the most sancti sanctimonious ones would feed their sanctimony by doing some volunteer work in a bad neighborhood a few times a week, I actually spent most of my free time in law school trying to extract my parents from the ghetto. Now, the good news is that my parents did leave when I, and by the time that I graduated from law school, we were officially, our entire family, out of the ghetto. The point is not that inequalities don't exist, but the point is that getting out of poverty is not supposed to be a cakewalk. Life is unfair and not everybody is fortunate enough to be born rich and not everybody is, is even fortunate enough to be born in this country. And I assure you that this country does not want the kind of economic equality and the kind of economic fairness that was imposed by the communist China of my childhood. In fact, even communist China itself does not want that kind of equality, which is why it adopted broad-ranging economic reforms, which is why it set itself firmly on the path of capitalism, and which is why it became the second largest economy in the world today. But let's not forget for a minute the lesson that we did learn from state intervention and state control of the economy. And let's not forget the lessons that we did learn when the state ran its citizens' lives. And the only thing that they will be equal in is misery and scarcity. In a free country, men and women can make choices and take responsibility for their own actions and extract themselves from less than stellar circumstances. And ultimately, it is economic growth and economic opportunities that will make our lives better. It is not government dependency, and it is not burdensome government regulations. America is not built on layer upon layer of grievance against those who have earned or inherited more. And lawlessness and wanton destruction certainly is not a way, and it does not create the path to racial justice, no matter how many racial minorities are involved. Ultimately, it is our own responsibility that serves as the foundation for success and independence. As I wrote in my book, quote, even in the ghetto, people have a chance to walk away from some of the worst attributes of a free society into its finest virtues, unquote. And I do firmly believe that those virtues are available to everyone else too, whatever their color, however modest their background. Now, I know it's a bit abstract to talk about virtues and freedom. Um, and I thought about this when I was back at Cornell last week. Uh, I remember when I was writing my book, I consulted one of my former professors there who has become a close friend of mine over the years. And I said to her that it was in the ghetto. It was in the ghetto that I learned to hate. And she said to me, the key, the key in life is to learn to unhate. And fortunately for me, I did learn to unhate. And, um, and I learned it in two very different places. Uh, I learned it at Cornell, where I went to college. And I also learned it at the Grand Canyon, where um, during the summer of my first, the summer after my first year in college, I got a job as a retail clerk at one of their busiest um, uh, national park lodges. Both of these places were endowed with spectacular natural beauty, and I suppose that helps a bit because it's a little bit hard to stay angry and, and, and it's a little bit hard to hate in places that beautiful, but, but it was more than that. Um, it was the power of higher learning at Cornell, and it was also the kindness of the people in the Southwest. All those people who clung to their guns and Bible, <laughs> who showed me a warm welcome. Um, and both Cornell and the Grand Canyon showed me the possibility of a different life, a better life. And they showed me this country's greatness as well as its goodness. And if it was personal responsibility that guided me out of the ghetto, it has been that goodness and that greatness and faith in both that has guided me in my years out of the ghetto. And so I am hopeful that despite all the challenges we face as a country, the good sense of the American people will ultimately prevail, and we will set ourselves on the road to freedom on a path to unsha unshackling ourselves from the welfare state. Thank you very much for having me, and I'd be glad to take any questions.
Wow, that's a story, isn't it? Um, I'll let you call on people okay. being okay. okay. Um, if you wouldn't mind waiting until the mic comes to you after Ian calls on you, if you give your name and your affiliation, and uh, we'll do questions for a little bit. And can I share a little story about the Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute? Mm -hmm. So the first time I hosted a speaker from Claire Booth Loose, it was Phyllis Schlafly, and she's a very controversial woman, and so all of these people at Cornell showed up having cross-dressed and with their faces painted, and, and then they started screaming a lot of profanities at Phyllis, and, and Phyllis handled it with so much elegance and so much grace, and she's all just been an inspiration to me since. But every time I give a lecture, I always wonder, is are there going to be people screaming at me <laughs> in profanity? Will people be throwing stuff at me? And, and I know at Heritage, Heritage does not allow that kind of stuff. But, um, but you know, but I every time I give a talk, particularly if it's a talk sponsored by the Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute, that memory always comes back to me. Um, and I am so glad that you guys have all these speakers who show up to very uncivilized places and, and you know, and, and sort of provide an example for, for the rest of us of for how we ought to behave. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Brianna Walden. I work at the Charles Koch Institute. Thanks so much for speaking. Thank you. I'm curious as to what you think or would define as the biggest barrier to people extracting themselves from poverty um, and whether that is like a government policy or maybe cultural apathy or maybe even a lack of exposure like you talked about your experiences and um, getting to kind of see the world beyond what the possibilities are. Thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for that question. I think it's uh, several things. I think part of it is that the government makes it very difficult for us to extract ourselves. So uh, let me give you an example. Um, in the whole disaster, this huge disaster that we know as Obamacare, we all know that people can, there are lots of folks who could not hang on to their doctors, could not hang on to their plans. Um, but there was more to that, right? And, and, and one example I always would like to bring up is that um, so, for instance, Obamacare expanded Medicaid drastically, and if you were not on Medicaid previously and you were below a certain income level, it's quite possible that you just didn't want to get on that kind of government assistance. In fact, there's a woman who wrote a piece about precisely that choice, but once Obamacare kicked in, they just automatically enrolled her in Medicaid and assumed that that was what she wanted. And and so you'd think that, okay, well, maybe she could just go back. But no, she couldn't. It wasn't that easy because Obamacare had gotten rid of her previous plan and, you know, and made it extinct, um, illegal. Uh, and then if she wanted a different plan, Obamacare has made all those other plans, private sector plans, much, much more expensive. And so the choice for her was much more stark after Obamacare kicked into place. And she was, you know, and she wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal about this. And so... And so it's very frustrating. And she made a conscious choice not to be on government subsidies, but the government made it a lot harder for her to continue making that choice. And so I think part of it is simply how the government operates. It makes it so much more difficult for us to live free and independent lives. The other part of it, I think, is simply that a lot of times people particularly people who are poor, they are not going to say no to free money. If you give them incentives to take money from the government, they're not going to say no. And I know this well. You know, in the immigrant community, a lot of people believe that the Asian immigrant community is very industrious. And, and a lot of that is true. But there are, and the, I guess the dirty little secret is that there are tons of people in the Asian immigrant community who are fully willing to take advantage of government subsidies because you know, as an immigrant, especially if you're one who doesn't speak English that well, you're not going to say no to free money, and you would find all kinds of entrepreneurial ways to hop on this subsidy wagon. Um, and, and and I think the key is one way to, to counter that is to find ways to create better incentives, to make sure that we are, in fact, temporarily helping those people who need a helping hand, um, and that we're not providing all kinds of bad incentives for people to remain dependent on the government. Um, and, and I think the, you know, and, and I think as you say, it's, it is probably true that it helps for people to show that there is a different way, that you can make it without government help, but, you know, but the barriers that the government um, put right in front of you 
you know, are very hard to surmount. A bad economy is actually one, probably one of the biggest barriers for people to get off, you know, government assistance. So um, sometimes it's hard to blame people for trying to get an extra few dollars of government assistance. So I think that those are, are a few thoughts I that come to mind. There, I'm sure there, there are others, and, and obviously the great people here at Heritage have all kinds of ideas of, of how we ought to go about eliminating these bad policies on the federal and state levels. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm Lashley Wolf, and I'm a friend of Cindy Rushing's, and she's generous enough to include me in these, <laughs> in these wonderful talks. Um, I've read a number of articles lately about this huge gap, one of them being in The New Yorker this week, this huge gap between the poor and the rich and how there really isn't going, there's no way that these people are going to succeed. There just isn't any way that they're going to succeed in the United States the way it is right now. How do we, how do I, as and us as Americans, make a difference in, in or, or towards the government in having these people understand that they can succeed? Uh, you know, usually I, so I hate the New York Times, so I try not to. <laughs> this was the New Yorker saying New York, even, oh, you, you, I'm not a big fan of them either, so. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, re I do read stuff. I, I don't read them religiously, but I do see their stuff from time to time. And I think, in fact, the article that you're talking about has been disproved or at least has been discredited to a large extent because even – I don't know if we're referring to the same piece, but I believe the, the author of the piece has come out and sort of dialed back some of his assumptions. So usually whenever I read – Papers like the New York Times or publications like the New Yorker, I, I take everything they say with a grain of salt and, and I question their assumptions, um, uh, you know, before I believe anything they say. It's a little bit like questioning the assumptions of Eric Holder's latest report on Ferguson. So the media has just bought into it um, wholesale. And, and, you know, and there I've seen maybe two people who have actually written very extensive critical um, articles about how flawed that report is. But getting back to your, your question, I think, first of all, I, I'm just not so sure how valid those assumptions are. But let's say, but, but, but let's assume that, in fact, they're, you know, that, that at least the arguments about inequality are true because we do know that there is, a, you know, that there is, in fact, economic inequality in this country. But, you know, but the question is, and, and I actually had a conversation with a good friend of mine who's an economist at, at another conservative think tank here in town just yesterday, and, and, and we were talking about, you know, yeah, I mean, if there is upward mobility um, and if there is still a path out of your current circumstance to better circumstances, then the inequality is much more of a moot point. Um, and I know that there are big differences between what, econ you know, what folks on the left say, particularly people like Paul Kruckman. I... Um, um, you know, and, and I, I think a lot of free market economists would disagree with those assumptions. But, but there are examples every day of how people have made it out of poverty. And in fact, the poorest people aren't necessarily the people who look like Barack Obama. I mean, if you look at the crop of some of the most prominent conservative politicians, Bobby Jindal, Susanna Martinez, and, and in fact, these actually go to, you know, let, let's talk about the white guys too, Rick Perry up until I think in his teens, did not even have indoor plumbing. Now that's real poverty. That's a kind of poverty that Barack Obama doesn't seem to know a whole lot about. And so, and Rick Perry today is, you know, a, a very successful former governor of Texas. Chris Christie is not exactly somebody who's, you know, who grew up in a household that had a whole bunch of money. He kind of talks like that too, but, you know, but that's part of his charm. Um, and I think that every day, day in and day out, we see people who have these great stories. And I think that we've just... I suppose part of it is that we ought to question every one of the assumptions that the left has piled right in front of us. And, and the other part is, you know, I, I do, you know, maybe fewer regulations, more economic freedom, um, all, you know, lower taxes, all of those things would certainly provide the kind of pro-growth policies that would create or strengthen upward mobility and, and allow people to actually emerge out of poverty. Yes. There's two. Oh, uh, yes, Becky Dunlop, uh, thanks so much for being here. It was a, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm just curious, as someone who thinks about things from a logical standpoint and has actually observed this Affordable Air, uh, Care Act, so to speak, go into place, 
and talking to people all around the country and all that you're reading, what do you see as the logical way out from the standpoint of Americans? Uh, logical way out of... Out of the Affordable Care Act. Oh. Um, y you know, I... So I'm not a health care expert by, by any means, and, and um, um, you know, and I, I think it's a tough, it's just a tough issue because this monster has been imposed on us, and, and you know, whatever one thinks of Ted Cruz's filibuster against Obamacare, he was right. You know, once this act goes into place, it's going to be very hard to dismantle it, and we've, you know, already seen... Um, the ramifications of that, and so, um, I, and so, I think it, it actually, you know, makes it all the more important for us to put the right policies in place in the first place. But I, I don't really have a very good answer to how we ought to reform our healthcare system. Um, uh, I am certainly, you know, I um, I recently moved back to the D.C. area from California, and I actually had a great plan in California, which I had to give up once I arrived here. Um, and and I think that one of the proposals that a lot of um, Republicans have put forth, and, and they've done so for a long time, is that why can't you allow people to buy these kinds of insurance policies across state lines, you know, and let more comp competition blossom. But, um, but I, I, I'm not um, – um, I, I think that part of it is also probably just for those of us who do believe in free market economics to, to make better arguments and to – um, to come up with better messages. I think everybody knows right now that the Affordable Care Act has created quite a disaster, but, you know, but there are plenty of people who still feel that um, there isn't a better alternative for people who need help um, or people who are not doing so well and people who don't have health care coverage. And, and I know that there are Republican alternatives, and maybe the key is just to do a better job conveying to people what those alternatives exactly are and what our plan is compared to, you know, the disaster that we currently have. There were. Hi, Laura Truman with the Heritage Foundation. I wanted to ask about the role of your family in getting out of poverty. Um, it seems like that's a pretty big deal, uh, but from the description, it sounds like they were working a lot, so they weren't always perhaps home. Um, and when you look at friends or people that you knew in your neighborhood, what barriers did you see, and, and how how do, how do you replace the family core when they don't have an intact family? Right, right. Uh, well, I mean, the family was a big part of my experience of tackling the issues I had in the ghetto, and and I, I think one major. Um, element of my ability to get out of the ghetto and for my family to get out of the ghetto was that there was a shared sacrifice. Um, I did a lot more things that kids my age would never have to do, and, and I continue to do many of those things. Um, um, but at the same time, my parents and, and my brother made sacrifices for me as well, and that had we remained in China, they were those were sacrifices that none of them would have had to, to make. So I think the family unit is crucial because you, you know, um, one, it provides stability. It allows kids to have a two family, two parent family. That that's hugely important. But at the same time, you know, a lot you because the difficulties are so great that a lot of times it's not that easy to just get out of poverty all by yourself. You know, we all get help from one person or another, and the family unit is the best place to get that kind of support. Um, when I was, um, every now and then when I get into my, an argument with my family, you know, we all have our gripes. You know, we'd be like, well, I did this for you. And they would be like, well, no, I did this for you. But putting that aside, and I'm kind of joking, you know, over, in the long run, what happened was we all had to chip in and, and make sacrifices for each other. Um, and, and when I looked at my neighbors or people I went to school with, um, there were similarities and differences. Um, for instance, I, I, in my book, I recount a story where I had a little bit of a problem with the kids. They were Hispanic kids from next door. And, um, and I, I was at the time already annoyed enough that I was afraid of the gunshots and afraid of the bad, you know, um, 
neighborhood and afraid of you know not being able to 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 yeah, to walk out in the middle of the night. But I didn't want to be afraid of just children from next door. So I walked next door to a Hispanic family and decided to tell them, this is how your kids ought to behave. And I noticed that despite our differences in color and differences in background, that they were very keen on disciplining their children. Maybe, you know, it was just tough for them because they were the parents were working in a way a lot, and so they couldn't. And, and so in a way, I in, in that sense, I found right there in their immigrant experience just how much we had in common. Um, and then, you know, there were, for instance, plenty of, um, I think the people in the ghetto that I saw who were most critical um, and most encouraging of kids who, you know, weren't performing were the black instructors. You know, they felt that all these kids could do better and they, you know, they were the ones, not all of them, there were plenty of really bad instructors, but, you know, but I was fortunate to have some who were very good and I noticed just how much they wanted the kids and in their classrooms to, to succeed. And you're right, sometimes, a lot of times, those kids don't have very good, um, a very good family support network. Um, and, and I think that is something that, and it's not something that the government can just decree and say, you have to have a better family, you have to have better parents. But ultimately, I don't think it's possible for people to, or for our society to emerge in more successful ways unless that family unit, you know, is strengthened, um, and and I and there are many times when the government actually does a whole lot of things to um, to weaken that family unit. But but I think in in the end, it is you know extremely important for you know for for people, particularly people in poverty, to rely on on that kind of support um, and to to use that to propel themselves to better things. Yes. My name's Frida Hugley. You didn't say anything to us about your life in China before you came here. So what standard of living did your family have there? Because you may have had a different model than the people who are born in the states who only know poverty. Uh, so I, I actually uh, devote the first half of my book to life in China. So for those of you who are interested, um, uh, if you're free to check it out there. Uh, and the, you know, we had, uh, China was very poor, and so, you know, we um, we lived a, a life that that didn't have the amenities that many folks here here have. And as I indicated earlier, you know, I, I, and I lived in China's third largest city, so compared to the folks who were doing back-breaking ba farm labor in, in the countryside, we actually were very well off. But even for us, you know, there were about six or seven, maybe more, six, seven, eight, eight of us in my family cram crammed into a two-bedroom apartment. Um, and, you know, we didn't have running hot water and, and things like that. Um, uh, you know, we went to, everybody went to school, and the school was state-owned and state-provided because at the time, you know, the communist um, uh, state owned everything and provided everything. Uh, what, you know, and, and I think your point is interesting. Because, so yesterday I, I uh, was at the nail salon, and, and the, you know, the lady that I, I like to use, she's from El Salvador, and, and she made an observation about how and she works with inner city youth, and, and it's an area she's very interested in. She made an observation. She said, you know, when she was in El Salvador, it was just so unimaginable for her that kids would just not go to school and would drop out. And there are a whole, whole bunch of kids who would, you know, walk for miles or, 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 you know, expend a lot of effort to make their way to school. And then she came to the U.S. when she was about nine or so. And, and there were all kinds of kids who had access to schools, but just didn't go, didn't show up, didn't think it was important. And and we were, you know, and, and I said, you know, in many ways that's also true from, you know, that that was something I noticed when I came here too. Um, maybe, you know, at least when I, maybe not as many of my classmates dropped out when I was in elementary school compared to, you know, later on in life. But, you know, but when I was in China, it would have been unimaginable for people not to go to school. Not everybody did well, but everybody understood that, you should do well. Your parents wanted you to do well. Um, and I got the sense from, you know, my El Salvadorian friend yesterday that that was sort of the expectation that her family had for her, and that was the culture that she grew up in as well. And so I think these societal concepts, these expectations, these standards that we 
set, um, they matter a whole lot. And if, you know, the expectation that's set for you is from the beginning is low, that the only expectation we have for you is for you not to end up in jail, that's not good enough. Um, and I think, you know, and I, I think our the instructors, the good ones that we have in the inner city, the, the pastors that we have, I think they all know that. And I think they believe that there is potential in everyone to do better, but that sometimes the circumstances are so difficult that if people around you, your friends are getting locked up, joining gangs, um, selling drugs, it is m very difficult for you to say no. Um, the pressure is great. But, but ultimately, I do think that it, yeah, and that's where the family comes in. It, it matters to have family members who can show you the right path, point you in the right direction. It matters to have friends who won't, you know, who won't judge you and who won't say that you're selling out if you do well in school. I think all of those things matter. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I saw a lot of that in the inner city areas, but, but I, I think that there is, um, um, there is certainly hope, and I think it helps when, you know, when, when leaders, both local leaders, state leaders, and national leaders actually, you know, spend time emphasizing that, that the pursuit of a higher education is a good thing. You know, hard work and all of those other qualities um, are, are, are actually things to aspire to um, and not something that you should laugh at. So, um, uh, and, and so, so I guess the, the sh you know, the, the, the long and the short of it is that I, you know, that they, these, I, um, I mean, I certainly hope that these I ideas will, will become more, prevalent in inner city areas where they're currently not. Anyone I've, else? I've got a question. Yes, um, you, yeah, in the introduction, uh, Michelle kind of touched on some of your career highlights. And um, you've had kind of an interesting path. I mean, Stanford Law, and then you worked in a law firm, and now you're doing this China blog for with the Wall Street Journal. I mean, how did you, how did you kind of chart this path? We love to... Um, share these kind of life stories with uh, particularly the young interns. And I know um, Michelle posts the, um, all of the lectures on the website. So um, it's great to get the, the diversity of these paths and you sure. can kind of put sure. a mosaic together. And yours is particularly interesting. <laughs> Just wonder if you can expand on it a little bit. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. Um, uh, I hate to say this, but you know, I guess my advice is don't be like me. And the reason I say that is I made a huge mistake when I went to law school, and I made an even bigger mistake when I went to practice law. And it contributes, and it has contributed to sort of this career that's not necessarily in a, you know, that did not follow a straight line. Um, and for a very long time, I was very bitter about having gone to law school, oh, particularly probably the most liberal law school in the country. And for a long time, I was rather bitter about having joined a law firm. Um, and even though it was a great law firm, um, it was just not for me. But, you know, but I guess only in America can, you know, a girl from the ghetto be bitter about having gone to stay for <laughs> law school and, and having practiced law at one of the country's top law firms. Um, and and it, it shows you just the abundance of opportunities that we have in this country. And, and at the time, I actually had what I believed, you know, when I chose to go do those two things, I had other opportunities that I felt I had given up and should not have given up. But And it sort of shows you just the abundance of opportunities that we do have in, the, in the, this country and that... Um, Ultimately, you know, free men and women make choices. In my case, I felt like I made some very terrible choices in my career, and so I would advise you <laughs> not to do that. But, you know, you have to – law school could be great for some people, but if people want to, you know, get advice about why you should not go, I am always happy to provide <laughs> that advice. Um, I don't think it's for everybody, and in fact, it could make you really, really miserable. Um, but, you know, but with that said, uh, uh, I um, have always – written, you know, my, uh, the, I started, I wrote my first op-ed when I was in college, and then I continued to write um, over the years, um, and, and when I was working at conservative think tanks, for instance, like at Hoover, for instance, um, there were lots of opportunities to do it, and, and you know, and currently, um, I am very proud of the, the China blog that the Wall Street Journal has put together, and I'm very honored that they've included me to be part of it. Uh, so, uh, so it's, it's something that I enjoy, I enjoy doing. I uh, intend to return to to the policy world, perhaps uh, on a 
you know, more involved bases in the future. Um, um, I very much enjoyed working for a congressional commission many, many years ago. Uh, so, you know, so I, I think there are, um, for those of you interested in public policy, obviously Washington is a, a great place great place for, for all of those pursuits. Um, I would, I, I guess the, you know, um, I, I would simply say that, that to, to, you know, aside from telling young people, don't sort of drift into going to law school. Um, aside from that, which I always tell people that um, I, I think it helps to pursue those things that you're, you're passionate about. Um, um, I also want to add one thing, because that is not always the most realistic way to go about it. Not every one of us comes from families with financial resources that could support us to go do everything we would like to do. Um, and, you know, and, and there were times in my life or in my career where I felt that, especially when I had made mistakes, that I felt that I didn't have a cushion, a, very, a, a big enough cushion to fall on when I didn't make those mistakes. And, and for those of us in positions like that, the key, obviously, is not to do what Barack Obama does, which is to go and, and harbor grievances against other people who are doing better, but that it, it helps to think about your options a little bit better. It helps to sort of think that, that there are times when you might have to go do one thing first before you do, go do the thing that you love because you know, of, of the restraints that you have, be they financial or family or, or whatever else, um, um, and that you know, it doesn't mean you have to let your dreams die, but but, you know, we all have to be realistic and we all have to, to, um, to be smart about what we do. So, so I'm probably not the best person to dispense career advice, but those are the two things. Don't go to law school. <laughs> and the other thing is be realistic about your, you know, dream big, but also try to be pragmatic. So those are the two things I would say. And then I know you have a Maybe I'll ask the last question. Um, but let me just comment on the law school. <laughs> In your career, I mean, you're a wonderful person because you've shown how you can start on one path and then you can shift yeah. when it's not quite right for you. You know, I went to law school too. Um, now, I worked my way through at night, and I can tell you at the time I was going, back in the 70s, I had no idea how helpful it would be to me in running a nonprofit, not in practicing law. So, <laughs> it, you know, it varies for every person. Right, but right, right. I think you're better and richer, perhaps, for the legal education, although I know what a long haul it was <laughs> and, and all that, but maybe it adds to uh, what you are. But I understand. I, I've heard a lot of people regret going. Um, it's worse when you go to a law school that is so fundamentally different right. from your from you in terms of politics and right. in terms of values, right. and I think that made it a lot right. worse for me. I remember too. that part. To get an A, you had to write a liberal exam. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, my last question, um, and then we can talk informally during lunch, takes you back to China. One of my favorite stories in your book, I'm going to ask you if you'll tell it, is when you were a little girl in school and you had something the other little girls didn't have and how they handled it back in communist China. You know oh, the story? Yes, I mean? yes. Um, so uh, uh, the first chapter of my book is titled Not Enough Nail Polish. Um, and um, back then, because communist China was so poor, not only did we not have running hot water, we also didn't have nail polish. And, but as it opened up to the world, my relatives from Hong Kong, for instance, came in. And they brought stuff for us. You know, the, their, their gifts range from electronics to, um, you know, to to fun snacks. Um, and one thing they brought for us uh, when I was very little was nail polish. And so, of course, I got all excited, and, and they painted my nails. And, and I showed up in kindergarten. And it created a huge firestorm because everybody else wanted some, too. But they were, there was no place to get it. Um, and I won't give away here what they did in order to, to get themselves to a comparable position. And, 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 but, you know, and at the time, I didn't really understand what was happening, and, and I just thought I was very happy I had nail polish. <laughs> Nobody else had it, but, you know, but that actually was great for me. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and there were all these people who went home to their parents and said, well, I, you know, Ying here has nail polish. Well, why can't I get some? But you couldn't because it was not available at a drugstore, you know. Um, and, and that just shows you how dire our economic situation was, um, just how little we had. And, and ultimately, I came to an agreement 
it was a negotiation with one of my instructors because it there was just so much chaos in her classroom because these kids wanted nail polish and didn't have it and it was all because of me and she knew it was not my fault but she needed to calm the situation ultimately we came to an agreed settlement um, and um, and I won't give that away and you, I'll, I'll let you guys read that in the in the book but it was a settlement that calmed everybody that calmed everybody down, um, and um, it, uh, um, it, it and and it was um, and I did something that was for the good of the class. But what's interesting is that even though I kind of have my nails painted today, mo- even though now that I am in the states and and um, there's plenty of nail polish <laughs> everywhere, you know, hundreds of colors. Um, I don't normally paint my nails, and so it, it, and and I I made that comment to a friend of mine whom you met, Michelle Ronda, who, oh, yes. um, uh, and she's a friend of mine from Hong Kong. And she said when she read my book, ever since she read my book, every time she painted her nails, she would think of that story. And then she found out, oh my goodness, you don't even paint your nails now. <laughs> now that you've got all these options, you know, to do this and French manicure, yada yada. But um, most of the time, I just go without it. And I guess it's that's one of the ironies. But you know, but it it, it speaks to all the choices we have that a lot of times we would just choose not to do something even if it's it's not available so um but i love actually i love that chapter uh, and, and i love that part of of you know those friends of mine that i had what a wonderful talk very moving very informative thank you for giving it thank you thank you all so much thank you for, for having me um,